Richard from La Brewing once again. Um, we're going to deal today with bottling. Bottling our wine, beer or spirit. I have to say I find it the most tiresome job that we have in uh, beer and wine making because it's just like repetitive and it's pretty boring to do. But it's so important and if we get it wrong we get infections and then the stuff goes off. So all that hard work we put in has been wasted. We have some gadgets which will make life a lot easier for us and saves a lot of time. First thing though, we really, really must make sure that when we put our bottles away, they are clean. So if this is had wine in and we've drunk our wine, give it a rinse and preferably just put something in the top just to stop any dust or anything like that getting in or alternatively turn it upside down. Same obviously with your beer as well, same actually applies. What we must do though is we must clean and sterilise our bottles before we put anything into them and luckily we have this bottle washer that's going to make life a heck of a lot easier for us. So we're going to fill this and we have two options. We can put a no rinse steriliser in here, that way we can clean our bottles and we don't have to worry about rinsing them. Or secondly, we can use a standard steriliser and it would really help if you've got two of these. This one with obviously our sterilised water in and a second one with clean water in. So those are our two options. What are we going to do? We're going to take our bottle and as you can see there's a plunger here. So the plunger would push up and down like so. It will be necessary to do a few to start with just to prime it to get it going. But we're going to push that up and down and as you can probably see the water is shooting up into the bottle and giving it a real good clean. And it's actually at quite good pressure as well. So that's really going up with a bit of force up there. So we've done that a couple of times to give it a good clean. And I would now, if it's a no rinse steriliser, I'll now put it onto my drainer, but I'm going to come onto those in a minute. Or alternatively, we would put it onto our second bottle washer, which is the one with the plain water in. So those are the options that we've got available to us with the bottle. Obviously the same applies to beer as well. That goes up and down like so. And gives it a really good clean. Okay. What we're now going to look at is we're now going to look at our bottling side. So I'll be back in two secs when I've got our bits together. Here's our little uh, bottle drainer that we use with two sizes. We've got a 40-ish and we've got an 80-ish bottle size. They do actually slightly vary depending on uh, when we get them. They come in sections. So each of these sections will clip on and you can go higher and higher and obviously lower and lower. So the advantage to this is that once we've rinsed our bottle, a la so, we can go straight onto our bottle drainer. And obviously if we're doing our beer ones, again, we can do the same with our beer, a la so. And that means that the water is then dripping down. This is the original one. There's a new one that's just come out, which I'm gonna show you. I actually like this. I think this is dead easy. And it's great as long as you're not wanting to transport it. So if you've got this on the side of your sink, perfect. All the water will collect, if I can show you, in this rim here. So there's a nice little rim that will catch all the water. And then when you come to get rid of the water, all you have to do is tip it and out, out she comes. Makes life dead easy. So I'll just show you the other option now as well. And this is the, uh, the new one that's just come out. We've got a tray which is designed to catch all the water. And then inside the tray we can stack our bottling rack, like so. So we'll put our bottles, again, we'll let them squirt in there. And in they go. So each one will go into this particular thing and you can imagine you've got 16 bottles four by four all the liquid is dripping down into our collecting tray 
tray. So any excess water goes down into the tray. We can then dispose of the tray and we can then move around our 16 bottles. Which means we've got a storage facility as well as a bottling facility. And when we've come to finish, put the top on like so. We've then got the option of stacking another load on the top. So these ones can then be bottled and it will allow us to do seven stacks. So again, you can get a lot of bottles in a fairly small space if they're stacked using these racks. So these ones are great for doing the washing and the rinsing and also for storage. I think this one is much easier if we're just wanting to get it done. And obviously value for money, this one is much better as well. So those are your options on bottling in terms of what we've got available. We looked at the little bottler as a way of being able to bottle our wine. One of the things that I should have said at the very start is the siphoning part, which is really quite interesting. We need to look at siphoning the wine from our bucket or from our container into our bottles. We've given you the option of the little bottler. We've also shown you the funnel that can be used, but we also have a siphon tube. Now the siphon tube, as you can see, this is our easy start siphon tube. First thing we're going to do is we're going to put the clip for the easy start onto the main tube. Now this, we tend to find we have a little indentation in our bucket. This comes in three sizes, small, medium, large. The one for the bucket is the medium. The small would be used for gallon jars and the large will be used for the bigger siphons. Uh, sorry, the bigger fermenters. What we're looking for is for this to go as close to the bottom as we can on our bucket. And if we look at the end of our siphon, it has an anti-sediment device. The idea here is that this will, once he gets it back into position, this allows the liquid to be drawn over this bottom piece. So we're not going to suck up the sediment from the bottom. There's no way anything's going to come from there. So it's going over the top and then up through the siphon. So we've got the siphon in position. It's clipped onto the bucket. The great thing about this clip is it means we can keep our hands free. And at the other end of the siphon, we have a little throttle valve. And the throttle valve will allow us to switch on and off the liquid that is coming through. And you can pull it through as far or as little as you want, depending on how much room you need. So this is like fully, you see what I mean? And then, when we want to stop the flow, you can see we've got a device that grips it in the middle of there. And that will stop it from actually coming through. But the advantage is we've already primed this so that we don't have to keep stopping and starting each time. Now, with the easy start siphon, we have a very simple action to get it working. We just go up and down like so, while the siphon is in the bottom of the bucket and then the liquid will start to come through and we can go straight into our bottles if we want to we can go into another container we can go into our gallon jar we can go into our bag in the box whichever it is that you want to do you can go straight in and then you've got the valve to switch it on and off once you've got going little tips there for you on the siphoning part which i think are really quite valuable when you come to bottling what we're now looking at is the actual corking part of the wine. First thing to remember is we've got two corks that we sell here that we would recommend. The first one, these are both what are called straight corks. And this one is what is called a filled cork. I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to get a good close up of this. But the filled cork makes the cork very, very smooth. And what they basically do is they stamp this out of a sheet of cork and there's lots of bits of cork left over. So they grind the cork up 
and then they bond it with glue to fill all the holes in the cork. So the initial quality of the cork isn't fantastic. But we would recommend using a standard cork if you're not going to keep your wine very long. Anything up to six months. Standard cork will do the job. If you're going to keep it any more than six months or you're doing a particularly nice wine, then our superior corks are, again, we're going to get a close-up of this. You'll actually see you've got some slight greens in them, slight holes, but they're very, very slight. And you can always tell the quality of a cork, um, which hasn't been filled like the first ones, by looking at the end. If you look at the end of the cork, you'll see there's very, very few holes in it. It's really solid. And that's the part that's obviously coming into contact with your wine. So we're looking for a really good base on the corks. Right, if we look at the, uh, the way we're going to insert the corks, then that's going to be something that we, we can have in terms of options. I'll leave you to decide which corks you're going to use. That's your choice. But we've got, oh, what I should always say as well with the corks, do not soak them. These corks have a silicon seal over them. It's very, very fine, but they're like washed with silicon. And that just helps to protect the cork and makes it much easier to insert into the bottle. If you soak these corks, you'll remove that silicon seal. And the purpose of it is then not worth having. What we're therefore going to do is we're just going to take our corks and all we want to do is very, very lightly wash the cork in water, very lightly, just to remove any dust that might be on the cork. That's all. I'm looking to remove dust. Let's look at the corkers that we've got available. The first one is what's called a knock-on corker. So the cork will go in there, this goes on top, that will sit on there and we'll smash it with our hand or with a hammer. As you can see, that is what I would call is very, very primitive. And unless you're on a really tight budget, I would certainly not recommend this particular piece of equipment. It does the job, but by God, it's hard work. The second corker we've got is what's called a two-handle corker. And you can imagine that again sits on there. The handles here are now pushed into place and are gripping it on the bottle and we just push it down and in the cork goes. So boom, in she goes. Now this one is quite a basic two-handle corker. So again, if you're on a budget, might be worthwhile. If you're not on a budget, the one that we would always recommend is the Ferrari Easy Corker. Now this one has an adjustment because obviously we're going to put a cork in to the bottle and depending on how far it pushes in depends on whether it will stick out of the top or go in too far. So for that purpose we have a nut here and that adjusts up and down. So we can alter the depth that the cork goes in up or down. That gives us the variation that we're looking for and makes life very easy for us. So the cork is going to slot in there, goes into position, and down she goes, nice and easy. One cork nicely inserted into the bottle. Don't forget we've got the adjustment that we've got here in terms of the height and depth of the cork, which is on this nut here. We're up or down depending on whether we want it in further or not. A free standing corker. This is the easiest piece of equipment for putting corks in. It really is, it makes, takes all the hard work out of it, but obviously we're looking around the 40, 50 pounds, so it's quite an investment. But if you are doing a lot, well worthwhile. Let me just run through the principles of it. As you can see, the base is adjustable depending on what size of bottle you've got. In the main, this is going to be used for doing full size 75 cl bottles. Some of the litres you'll be able to get on as well. The smaller bottles you need to put something on here. Uh, 
I actually use a can of tuna, put it on there and then put the bottle, the half size bottle on the top of it. So we can use it for smaller bottles but you need to wedge something on the top here just to make it easier to work and bring the height up so that it's in the right position. If we put the bottle into place, underneath we've got the jaws and all we do is take the corks that we have previously rinsed Remember, we just a light rinse of the actual cork. We're not looking to get rid of that silicon seal that comes with it. We don't want to remove that. Cork goes into position there. And then as this comes down into position, the good thing is the base actually starts to get locked into position. And as you can see, this is now not going to move. There's no adjustment on this. It's locked it. The bottle's in position. The cork's in here now, and we're just going to come down with our lever. Now when we get to this position, the base is now locked. That is solid. It's not going to go anywhere. And as we pull it down, the cork is going to go into the bottle. You can just see the cork coming through there. Off she comes. And there's our cork pushed in nicely. Now the great thing as well about this is you can probably see we've got a, an adjustable nut here. That's going to adjust the amount that we're going to push the cork in. You might need it just to have a couple just trial runs to get it in the right position. But you want it so that the cork is sitting flat with the top of this bottle. Okay. Freestanding corker, super piece of kit. You're looking between around 40 to 50 pounds, but it really does make life dead easy for you. Once we've done the corking, a lot of people like to obviously add a label of some sort. We've got varying types depending on what the style of wine is that you're using. But we've got these different types of labels. A lot of them like these are self-adhesive. So they'll peel off and they'll just go onto the bottle. The only problem with the self-adhesive ones is they're a bit of a nightmare to get off later on. We also do a range of Van der Plaire, which is just like a, um, uh, a wine label that you can actually write on and you can put what type of wine it is. Now these ones are not gummed, so don't go licking them because nothing's going to happen. What we strongly recommend if you're wanting to put a label on that is not gummed is just get a little saucer, put some milk in it. Yes, ordinary milk. And all you're going to do put your finger in the saucer of milk and run it round the four edges. Stick it on the bottle. It sticks fantastic. But the best bit is that when you come to take the label off, if you just soak it in water, the label will just drop off and it doesn't leave any marks or anything like that. A little milk, that's all it is. So just remember that one. That's a little free tip I've given you. It doesn't cost anything, that one. We then looking at after we've labelled it and we've, we've, uh, we've corked it. The bottle should always be stood upright for the first three days. Don't do anything else with it. Don't shrink it. Leave it standing upright. What will happen is if we've squeezed the air at this top part. So if some of the air wants to get out, somehow it squeezes through the cork and it will come out. Once we've had the three days of it being upright, we then always must store our wine bottles on their side. We must keep this cork moist. If we don't keep it moist, then it starts to get very brittle, and when we pull it out with a corker, the chances are it's going to snap. We need to keep the cork moist. What we can then do is we can then shrink the cork with one of these little shrink caps. All we do with the shrink cap is we will just hold it on in position with our finger like that and then we rotate this in the steam of a kettle or we can use a paint stripper gun or a really top quality hairdryer just to shrink this down. What will happen is once we've shrunk it in the steam of the kettle it will then grip tight onto the bottle and make a really great seal. This will then double up as twofold, prevent any leaking from, from your cork but also looks great from a presentation point of view. These come in a variety of colours as well. Depending on what type of label you're going to use, you can then pick your colour to go with it. So just hold it on in position there, 
rotate it in the steam of the kettle, that will shrink it down, will grip, grip it nice and tight and will make a great seal for you but also will look great from a, um, a point of view, uh, display point of view. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to come on to other options because some people say to me bottling is a pain in the backside. We seem to spend all our time bottling. Is there another way that we can, can get our wine where we're not having to mess around bottling? So I'm going to come on to that now. We're looking at other options now to the real chore of bottling. I'm going to come up with a few ideas and tell you how we go on doing it when we're uh, bottling our wine. You've got your standard bottles as we mentioned before, 75 CLs. What we like to do is we like to put our wine into demijohns. We, the demijohn will hold about five litres. We'll transfer the wine, once it's cleared, into the demijohn. And we'll leave it stored in the demijohn. Now, we have, with the demijohn, an option of what's called a safety stopper. This is, this is like a one-way valve. And this will go into the top of the demijohn. And I don't know whether you can see, but we've got a little red stopper on the end with a rubber that's held in position. And if we look on the inside, there are two little holes in the bottom there that come up underneath the rubber. So that if there's any slight movement of air in the demijohn, it blows the rubber away, but then it reseats. So it's a self-sealing um, a self-sealing cap that we put into the top of the demijohn. This allows us to make sure we're not going to get a bung popping out or some people will put a bung and an airlock in here. The disadvantage with that is that the airlock can dry out and before you know it you've then got air coming in. The most important thing when we're using a demijohn is to make sure it's full. We want to fill right up to the neck here, as close as we can to the top. We don't want any headspace at all. The demijohn needs to be full. If we're doing a um, 30 bottle kit we're going to fill probably four and a half, maybe five of these demijohns, depending on your, um, uh, your, uh, the amount that you've actually got out of the kit itself and how much you, you, you'll lose on racking and filtering. Between four and five demijohns, so that's what you're going to need. Brown ones are fine, clear ones are good. Brown ones are very difficult to get hold of, but if you do get them, they are like gold. And they're really good because then they won't allow the wine to fade at all if you were to leave it in sunlight. The sensible thing is obviously not to leave this in sunlight. And it wants to be stored in a coolish, darkish place. That's the absolute ideal if you can find it. But obviously we're, we're down to what we've got available to us. We're going to fill four to five demijohns and we're going to let the wine mature in these demijohns. And then what I like to do is as opposed to um, just drinking it and using the demijohn as a, a drinking vessel, I will then put it into what's called a bag in a box. Now you've probably seen these in supermarkets. They normally do three or five litre boxes that they store wine in and they have a little tap on the front. We have our own version of it. This is the one here. This is a five litre one. So what we do with the five litre one is we transfer it from the demijohn directly into our five litre bag in the box. We'll fill the bag in the box with liquid, so this is going to be absolutely full. The tap goes into position, and this is a completely reusable bag. So once it's empty, we can clean and sterilise. Obviously we need to clean before we start, make sure it's all nice and clean before we actually put in. Once we've put the wine into position, and we've got it in the bag, we'll then bang the tap into position. Once we bang the tap into position, we then need to remove any excess air which is in the bag. So we'll squeeze it with the tap in the open position until we start to see a little drip of liquid coming out. There'll be no air in the bag. Okay. Once we've done that, we can then put the bag into the box. The box has a cutout here to take the tap so the bag will go into position in here with the liquid, it will fold over, fold over, fold over. We'll then take out this and pull the tap through. 
this is reusable. So each time we've used a gallon jar, we can then fill it our box. The box, if it's white or rosé, can then be left in the fridge. So you've got nice cool wine all the time. I have to say, one disadvantage to the bag in the box. Unlike a bottle, when you want a bottle of wine, you know you've had a bottle of wine. With this, you've got the tap on it. And it's very easy not to keep count of how much you're drinking. So please bear that in mind. Don't be irresponsible. With this, you can draw off a bottle. And that we always suggest, fill a bottle and then use the bottle. Get a nice carafe, something like that. Make the presentation look good. Presentation always makes wine look, taste better. As you can see with this one here that we're doing, this has got a very flimsy type of bag. It's, it's perfect for wine. We like the flimsy one for wine. We also do a firmer one, which is this. You can see it's a much firmer material with a slightly different tap on it. We prefer these ones for beer, but they are both universal. You can use them for wine, you can use them for beer. Now again with this one, slightly different, we're going to fill with liquid. We then put the tap into position, screw it on, <coughs> open the tap valve to let any air out, and then we're just going to squeeze it until we've got rid of all that air, and then we can shut the tap over and hold it in position. Once it's in position, we can then use, again, our bag in the box. This goes into place with the wine all in place. Sides go down, top goes down, and again, you can see we've got a, a perforated cutout, which will then perforate, and we can then have the tap coming through. A little bit of sellotape in position, and again, this can go in the fridge. If you are using it for beer, do not even think about doing a secondary fermentation because obviously this will explode. It will just blow up. If you're doing beer, make sure the fermentation is well and truly finished before you put it into the bag in the box. I think it's a brilliant way of taking the, the work out of bottling. You store in gallon jars, you're going to need four to five of them for your wine. Once it's matured, you then transfer it directly into your bag in the box. The bag in the box, if it's white and rosés, can then go in the fridge. If it's red, you can leave it out at room temperature. Perfect way to make sure you're not spending hours bottling.